Hello, everyone. Welcome to Better Talks. I'm here today with a very special guest, and I'm going to kindly allow him to introduce himself to the audience. I am Thomas R. Wilson. Um, I am a business owner, writer, advocate, storyteller, and so much more. Um, there is a lot that I do, so much that we don't have time to go over everything, but thank you for having me here. Thank you, Thomas, for being here. Um, I know you, you do quite a lot because when I read your profile, you're a man of many talents. You know, you are, you are so multi-talented that you engage yourself in many activities and largely they are community-based, empowering, adding value to, um, to society. And I will see that as a social entrepreneurship. So in that regard, can you share with the audience what are some of your contributions in terms of impacting your society? Absolutely. Uh, so my primary focus is working with underserved communities, but in that I work with anyone who wants to seek sensory friendly experiences. I'm also a workplace advocate. Um, doing advocacy in the workplace and very organ various organizations leading talks. Um, my sensory friendly work is designed around bringing sensory friendly uh, events to communities that are seeking a difference from uh, the norm. I, I often reference concerts because they are loud. There's lots of people. It's very energetic. And mine is my work is kind of the opposite. Mine is designed to be uh, person more person centric, smaller avenues, uh, less noise, spaces for people to be able to go where they need to, if they need a break from a group. Um, among that, though, I've also been in healthcare for twelve years. I opened my business RNH Creative Advocacy and Storytelling in twenty twenty one. I also do within that business. I do Dungeons and Dragons and storytelling events for adults and youth. I've done um, a variety of talks, educational courses. I am an educator on ELT school, and I am also someone who believes very strongly in the power of the written word, having written several articles and books and pieces on my experiences, both as a provider and event facilitator, but also someone living with neurodiversity. Um, overall, my work is really focused on the idea of using empathy-based leadership and the power of questions and raising up other people's voices. Um, so often in events, I find it's people leading the event who are always heard. So all of my work is helping people find their communities, find their space, find what works best for them, sensory and otherwise while also being able to share their voice without judgment, without um, criticisms, without derogatory comments, and helping to pull all of those in to those spaces, to those experiences that honor who all of who a person is. Wow, you said quite a lot, but there's three um, categories that I would like to focus on. The first one is as a, on a professional level, and then... You mentioned diversity, the impact of a diversity in the workplace, and then you mentioned a key term, empathy leadership. That's the first time I'm hearing that word, a different type of leadership. So let's mm -hmm. get to the um, the professional aspect of things because you're so broad, you're all over the place. I'm just curious to know, how do you really um, manage your time and your activities effectively to be able to um, pursue the things that you're passionate about, the things that you're fighting for? Love that question. It's not one I'm asked a whole lot. And the simple answer is a lot of dedicated time, um, a lot of knowing where to put my time and how. Uh, but I utilize a lot of different methods around time management, around what I can tackle. So one of the core things I do is I designate each day to a specific set tasks. That way I get a variety in what I do. And if I skip something one day, I can go on to another day and have that task and have the energy to do it. Another huge thing in this management of how I do everything I do is the understanding that I need rest. I need to be able to do this. So 
I understand that if I don't take care of myself and I don't have the passion and the drive that I do by breaking up days, breaking up those moments, I'm not going to do my job right. And so whether it's talking to organizations, communicating with people I work with, all these things, the biggest thing is really boundaries. Um, I need to know how I can apply my boundaries, not just to myself and my well-being, but to the well-being of my community, to the well-being of my work, and to make sure that I'm not overworking myself or tackling the task too much. I hope that kind of answers your question. Absolutely. I mean, you pretty much um, share with us how you're able to balance things in place. Um, you have systems in place, and you, you mentioned about um, taking, taking, taking a break, resting, because your health is very important. If you don't have your health, how are you going to be able to <laughs> juggle so many things? So my other question is diversity in the workplace. And I'm pretty sure you're from the U.S. And that's something that um, the U.S. government um, preaches most of the time, diversity, to, to be inclusive, to get different cultural background into politics, in the business world, women and all that stuff. I'm absolutely for that. So when we talk about diversity in the workplace, we talk about diversity, most times we focus on people's complexion, skin color, but that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on diversity. Let's say yeah, that's one aspect of it. What I want to focus on diversity of people's ideas, diversity of people's potential, diversity of people's personalities, diversity of people's passion that they bring, vision, virtue, and values that they bring to that organization. So what's your take on that? This is another great perspective. Um, so I agree. I think for diversity is not just skin color. It is those things. And so a lot of my work in particular is helping people with lived experience with the diagnosis or diversity, whatever that person wants to claim. And part of that is taking in people's opinions. And part of that is also making sure the workplace is accessible, which I always say accessibility goes far beyond the physical. A lot of people think of like wheelchair ramps and things like that when we talk about accessibility, but it's also spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, um, cognitive. All of these things are elements of true accessibility. So when I do the work in the workplace, what my emphasis is on not just taking someone in and hiring them and go, oh, we have someone with neurodiversity. They're like the token employee. It actually challenges that so that people can be integrated into the workplace so that their needs, their accommodations, or I know some people don't like the word accommodation anymore, um, but their, their needs are met and making sure that those employees are heard, are valued for their ideas. Um, I find like a lot of organizations confuse um, and the employment first movement with hiring only people with neurodiversity. And that's not bad. That is a wonderful thing to do. But what really fits into the neuro, uh, employment first aspect is the, like, as you said, like it's honoring all of who a person is, their ideas, making sure they're valued, but also not highlighting them and being like, oh, this is the person that we have with this, you know, diagnosis or lived experience. Um, and so in that, I truly believe that we need to get people into the workplace with a variety of different lived experience, um, understanding knowledge, because so much of that experience that can come from individuals from the communities I work with, from communities outside of, is the evolution of the workplace. Is this deviation from making someone like a token, like a special symbol of something and making sure the workplace actually works for all people? Because if it doesn't, we're not going to have a truly equitable workplace. And it doesn't mean that we have to, like, you know, shuffle them off to the side or the back room or all these things. It just means working alongside them as best as they can do. Even if you don't have a diagnosis or lived experience, that's how the workplace should act in my honest opinion. My question to you is that how would you go about balancing competency and diversity or how would you go about prioritizing either one of them? So I would say the first thing, um, is I feel like a lot of people, when we, we think of underserved communities, there's the idea that they're not 
going to be competent in the workplace due to some real biases and, you know, ableism and a lot of other elements. But I think the first thing to acknowledge in that is that these are these are fallacies. These are things that have been made up to hold communities back to kind of justify not hiring someone, even if someone has, um, you know, is is wheelchair like lives in a wheelchair or has difficult difficulty commuting that doesn't mean that that individual can't be a success in the workplace Mm -hmm. and like i use those two examples just because that's what a lot of people think of with struggles but the reality is many people can do that and there's this element of utilizing how can we help the workplace work best for the employee and so within that i would say first Think of that because many people within the communities I work with in our diverse community, mental health community, many other communities want to work. It's just they face very significant bias. And so the other thing I would emphasize is making sure you're actually training your employees appropriately. Um, I, I have, because of my own neurodiversity experiences where I was in the workplace and someone saw that and they took a dislike to me. And my job experience spiraled down into this kind of idea that I could never succeed because they didn't think I could. So if we actually hold people up, um, train them effectively, how they learn, because that's another issue. We teach so many people how we want them to learn, not how they actually learn. And so I think that's something that really needs needs to change. And there is a lot of data out there, a lot of emphasis that people within these communities can be among your best employees. They can thrive. They can be excellent customer service people or salesmen or whatever you want them to be. In fact, I even listened to a lecture not that long ago about someone who's working for an organization that develops things for NASA. And that individual is excelling beyond what they ever thought. Um, All of this our elements. And then I would also say we have to make sure that we avoid this trend in the workplace, which is kind of this demonization of people with extra needs or lived experience, whatever you want to call it, in the sense that if someone comes in on a bad day and they're very much feeling their their you know symptoms, um, a lot of people in a lot of play- workplaces will jump into the mentality of, oh, this is, this person's immediately not going to work anymore. They're too disruptive. And so when it comes to competencies, I don't think it's necessarily the individual. I think it's the workplace and the evolution that needs to change because there are many people who can do the job, who can do the work. They're just not being hired. And I think a lot of the problem within America's workforce right now is people want to be um, inclusive, but there's so much that people are holding on to from very detrimental mindsets that are not working for a lot of communities. Wow, interesting. So this leads me to my third question when it comes to leadership, because leadership evolves. And mm-hmm. you mentioned that right now, the way we lead is completely different from the way back in the days, but how would you go about um, approaching leadership in diversity? And you mentioned a powerful word about empathy. And and I believe it's leading according to the people. There is a big change in leadership going on in today's day and age. I think part of it has been the last few years of human history. Um, successful businesses have learned that they need to honor their employees more. I think a part of it is also the younger generations that are coming into the workplace. Yes, there's a lot of things a lot of people don't like, but one of the things I love about Gen Z and um, even younger people is they have a very strong mental health mindset. They have a very strong worker equity mindset. And, you know, no one's going to be their best self when they're a teenager. It's going to be hard to make that work. But those changes are really beautiful because I grew up in the 90s. Those things weren't a big like we wanted them, but many people didn't even acknowledge them. Um, And so when we come into leadership, I think a big part of what's happening is workers, organizations are acknowledging they need to change 
And so uh, the idea of listening to people, the idea of allowing extra days for rest, the idea of this focus on worker care is huge because people, those are all empathy based. But what really needs to happen is we need to evolve those ideas because there's also, as I'm sure many people around the world have seen, there are these massive changes in the mindset of what people are willing to do at work, how they are willing to work. And so if we can continue to honor those, because I, I can tell you as someone who has done his own leadership through his business and has had way more success than many people expected off the idea of caring for the people I've worked with and off the idea of caring for the people who accept the work that I do for them, the idea of being empathetic, listening, non-judgmental, uh, strengths-based focuses, all of these ideas in a focus of that in leadership are things that have been missing for a long time. And not in all cases, many workplaces have done a good job for years, but we need to apply these, we need to continue, and we need to continue to evolve these mindsets beyond everything that I've mentioned, because that's when I truly believe the workplace society will get better and better. Because I hate to say it, for a long time, workers weren't on a lot of businesses' minds. They, the trading on might, it was profit over people. And I think we're starting to see this evolution of, you know, it's still very imbalanced, but people getting closer and closer to profit. Um, yeah. It's very interesting because I look at it this way. Profit. No, I'm not going to put profit first. I'll put people, purpose, and profit. Because I believe that people are looking for a sense of purpose. People nowadays don't want to just go to work because of the money. They want to also go to work for meaning. And when you're able to give your employees a sense of purpose, then I believe the profit is a byproduct. You mentioned about um, leadership in a different way. Where in the career place, you mentioned caring. People need to feel like they're cared for. They're cared for their mental health. They are care for their emotional health. They are care for their physical health. You also touched on not just the caring aspect. People are fighting for a cause. Everybody wants to be involved in a cause. It could be Black Lives Matters. It could be what's happening between Israel and Palestine. Because that's the, that's the generation that we're in right now. And then people want to have a sense of contribution. They want, to, they want to feel like they're making a difference because we live in a social media world where everybody wants to be famous. You see? So I think care, cause, and contribution is what I believe our generation is looking for working for any company. So what's your view on that? I so very much agree. Um, I, I think... Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd attribute to millennials. I think there are people in older generations who had the same mindset. Um, but there's just this idea of working for someone who is going to work us to death. Um, going to show up each day, going to go to that job we hate, going to go to that experience that like chips away at our soul kind of thing. It's just not what many people want anymore. It's, it's not worth yeah. it. Um, I, I think there are, you know, there are so many kind of jobs out there that people never thought would exist and never thought would kind of happen. And I think so much of what you said was so true where um, we are looking for something more. And I think that's one of the great things about the movements against, you know, corporate greed and all these other things. I'm not going to call out any organization because I don't know all of the truths of many organizations. But we have just seen in so many years that there are many organizations that seem to care less and less about employees. And so what I love about this idea of people pursuing what they love, pursuing their person, their passion, their purpose, is they are chipping away at what once was and didn't work for people for a very long time and are now establishing this foundation of what I want to do, what makes me happy. And 
I truly believe that purpose and passion are two things that can lead to so much good in life. I'm not going to use the word happiness because I think happiness, like the culture around happiness is very toxic in and of its own self where like if you don't feel happy then something's wrong but happiness is not meant to last forever there are so many other sustainable aspects of life that can make you feel fulfilled and like your purpose and i would argue that's better than always feeling happy because you have something sustainable there and i think that mindset is starting to evolve and people around the world are accepting it and are acknowledging that there's this evolution in the workplace and are pursuing what they want. Brilliant answer. So my last question to you is, what are your top three transferable skills that anybody can obtain from you? So the first one is empathy. Um, I truly believe that anyone can learn to be empathic. Um, for the longest time, people believed that the neurodiverse community couldn't adapt, adapt empathy. That was never true. Um, we've learned through scientific research, some people just feel so much empathy that it's overwhelming. But we can all learn to be empathetic. We can all build those skills of listening and understanding in. The second one, um, I would say active listening. Uh, this is another thing that I'm seeing a lot of the variation from with the idea that I'm going to talk, but I'm not going to listen. And I think we need more of that, not just from people my age, not just from older generations, but all people. And then the third one is, I'm going to say patience. We can all learn to be patient. I am someone who doesn't like to wait. I am someone who doesn't like to um, wait in line. So I have to remind myself to use all of these skills each day, especially having my own mental health and neurodiversity. I have to be willing to apply them each day, but I cannot tell you how much all three of these skills can help you become a success if you are able to apply them effectively. And it will help people to differentiate themselves as in this world that feels so close off they are ways to opening up doors and ways to explore what humanity is capable of with ourselves and with others thank you uh, mr thomas for sharing those three powerful points empathy active listening and patience can you share with us how the audience can reach out to you in case they're interested in what you do yeah so i'm on linkedin at uh, Thomas Wilson RNH Creative Advocacy, I can make sure there's a link there. I always welcome um, the use of my email, which is NDTTRPG. I can make sure that link is sent as well. And then I'll also have a link tree, which will explain articles and other interviews and conversations and games and all of these different things that I use to help empower the community. That's a wrap, everyone. Thank you once again, Mr. Thomas, for joining us, for sharing powerful insight, especially in the workplace, different types of leadership, some of your wonderful advice. Thank you. Thank you. This is a blast.